Uh, actually, uh, uh, two things come to mind, uh, though probably more. Um, one is that, in my view, the field has not attended as it might to everyday writing practices, um, uh, especially um, in terms of the documents that have both shaped everyday writing practices and that tell us something about how people have written. We, of course, have um, interview-based studies, uh, like Deborah Brandt's uh, work, of course, and we have some document-based studies. I'm thinking here of Katrina Powell's work looking at the letters that uh, people in the Shenandoah Valley used to try to hold on to their land. Um, but um, those are exceptions, I would suggest, to the rule. Um, the rule being that we're much better at looking at student work, we're much better now at looking at program histories, that seems to be almost a commonplace, um, and it's only more recently that we're beginning to look at everyday practices. The thing about a postcard is that, um, as um, only one commentator that I found has said, um, uh, and it's somebody who writes in the UK and, and is basically a cultural studies critic, uh, Millsnay, I think is her last name, Esther Millsnay. Um, uh, it, it is, and we don't actually need uh, this comment because we can see it for ourselves, um, and that is that a postcard is a thoroughly democratic genre, possibly the most democratic genre uh, that we might see in terms of its ability to forward the writing of anyone whether that person be a child um, or an adult uh, whose signature consists of an X. So postcards on the one hand, when you uh, have a robust archive, and we might talk about what that means, um, can, um, that archive can show us how postcards developed as a genre over time. And they show us an interesting genre because it's a very regulated genre. Created in 1873 by the U.S. Post Office, the Post Office has decided over time in this country where you can put the address and where you cannot uh, write. So for instance, the, um, the single back card um, was common until 1907, which meant that you could only write on the front of the card, and that meant that you were writing around whatever the image was, excuse me, or um, on top of it in a kind of layering effect, which is actually really interesting because that begins to forecast some of the layering that we see in composition today. So on the one hand, you can see the development of this genre over time um, in a both sponsored and self-sponsored kind of way. Um, and on the other hand, you can actually see what people did with the postcard, which wasn't necessarily what the genre itself told people to do. So it's very com there. There were postcards, for instance, that functioned as birthday cards uh, because they basically said "Happy Birthday" on them, and on the back there was a sort of Hallmark-like birthday verse. But then people would pick up a run-of-the-mill postcard that looked something like this and they would turn it into a birthday card, a Christmas card, an Easter card, and I have versions of all of those. So it's interesting to see what people do with the genre, especially when it is as scripted in some ways as, as, um, as, as this genre is. So there's a lot to be learned here, and I haven't actually really spent much time on what people have done with postcards or on how they've circulated, but it's very clear that they did circulate. Um, Scott Gage, who uh, is at uh, Colorado State Pueblo and who uh, finished his uh, degree here last year, uh, did a very fine dissertation, uh, uh, part of which focused on the impact of um, lynching postcards and how the circulation of those cards basically constituted a certain kind of community. Um, the circulation of postcards documenting the 1906 San Francisco earthquake uh, was sufficiently uh, w wide and large that the city fathers in the San Francisco call said, please stop sending those images away because no one will come back to visit us and that will actually be a problem. So there's another message here. We talk about circulation, um, but we haven't actually, we talk about it, I think, 
um, in in some in some small ways, uh, it's not been a um, a large theme of the field. I think it's becoming a little larger, but there's some assumption. I think sometimes when we when we talk about circulation that that it's a a new thing, a current phenomenon that they're you know, and and we talk about it of course in aspirational terms because we want students to compose texts that will circulate, and I'm all on board with that. I think that's great, but I'd simply point out that some of the circulation has taken place a long time before now, and um, and it's good to know a little more about how that worked and what the effect of that was, because it gives us an historical context that is different than the historical context that we typically evoke. If you go back and look at the history of Frederick and Kopp, there's one school of thought that suggests that in the current version of Frederick and Kopp, that one way um, it was established as a field prior to its becoming established as a discipline, one might say, uh, was through the work of people like Janice Slower and Ed Corbett, who reached back to classical rhetoric to provide something of an intellectual foundation for the field. I think what I'm advocating is that we hearken back to a more recent time when everyday people were doing very interesting kinds of writing, and that that too creates an intellectual foundation for the field. And in this case, the intellectual foundation, believe it or not, is actually located in the postcard. That's what I would say.